adventure not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hi there, how's it going? Today is Moth Day and I want to start out by showing you how I stay in touch with the world of moths. This is my moth trap. Every night I turn on the light, the moths come to the light, they fall into this funnel, and they wind up in this jar because moths are too stupid to find their way back out through the funnel. Now, this is my way of keeping track of what sorts of moths are flying around in my neighborhood at you know various different times of the year. Most of the time I just let them go. If I get a lot of tent caterpillar moths, I'll feed some to my lizards, I must admit. And if I find beautiful moths, I'll take pictures of them. Got a Plusia venusta last year. That was a beauty. Ah, looks like it wasn't much of a night for moths last night. A couple of little tiny ones in there. And here's one good-sized moth. I don't think I've ever seen this one before. It's kind of gray with some uh, mossy-looking green bits on it. Have a look. Okay, now you see the way this little critter is shivering. It's doing that to warm up the flight muscles, the muscles that work the wings. And the reason it's doing that is because they can't really fly very well until their muscles are warm enough. In fact, while they are active, they are warm-blooded creatures. If your biology teacher ever told you that they had the same temperature as the air around them, wrong Ola. In fact, they can have a body temperature up around the 30 degree Celsius mark or even higher and their bodies are fuzzy to insulate against losing heat. So it looks like, oh, there, uh, there it goes. And we'll probably never find that moth again. I hope you got a good look at it while it was here. Seize the moment when you're dealing with moths. Carpe Lepidoptera. Some moths can hear bats coming and avoid them. Some even send out noises of their own to jam the bat's radar. You know, one way around the fact that there are so many small, difficult to identify moths is to focus on the few species of big, beautiful, easy to identify moths, like the giant silkworm moths in the family Saturniidae, a favorite of moth-loving people everywhere. Of course, the most famous of all giant silkworms was Mothra. A huge silkworm about the size of a school bus and the sworn enemy. Godzilla. Look, Mothra has come to battle Godzilla. Life imitating art. Too bad we don't have those little tiny women that sing to Mothra. Mothra! Beautiful stuff. <sighs> anyway, I want to show you this moth in all seriousness because this is a very neat moth. This is actually a Cecropia moth, which is a pretty typical member of the giant silkworm moth family. This is a female. She has big fuzzy antennae, but the male's antennae are even bigger. And she also has a fuzzy sort of teddy bear body, which is absolutely full of eggs. They don't, uh, they don't have much of a mouth. When they hatch out of the cocoon, they live just long enough to attract a mate and then lay eggs and then they die. They attract the mate by giving off a perfume and the male can smell that perfume with his antennae and come flapping on in from even a few kilometers away, which is pretty amazing, uh, you know, I'm, could you smell one moth a couple of kilometers away? Not likely. Very interesting. Anyway, then she, uh, she lays her eggs on the appropriate species of plant, depending on which species of silk moth you're talking about, and the silk moth cycle starts again. Fantastically beautiful moths as well, with lovely velvety patterns on the wings. Whew, you gotta like them. Now, would you like to see what the cocoon looks like that that Cecropia moth came out of? Here it is. 
looks like a really poorly made cigar with some fuzzy bits on it. That's the silk and uh, the leaves that the caterpillar um, wove into the cocoon when it was making the cocoon. And I'll cut it open and show you what's inside. How are we doing there? Is that... Oh, that's not good. Now, I haven't... I got through the outer wall here. I haven't got through the inner wall, and I don't want to muck up the actual pupil skin because that's what I want you to see. See, if you were a bird, you'd have to go to a fair amount of trouble to get into this thing and eat that sleeping little pupa inside, which is probably why birds don't bother. Birds don't have scissors. Oh, you're starting to starting to see the pupa in there now. And remember, the cocoon was built by the caterpillar in the fall when these leaves were a lot more malleable, you know, softer and easier to work with. Okay, now, if I lift that off, you can see inside there, that's the shell of the pupa. This is the actual outer skin of the resting stage between the caterpillar and the moth, and that's, uh, that's what it looked like. That's where the wing goes there, and the head down there, and the abdomen there. So how do you like that? What a nice, cozy little place to spend the winter. I'm here in the insect collection room of the Provincial Museum of Alberta. Now, did you know, you cultured folk out there, that there are over 100,000 species of moths known to science? That's an awful lot of moths. There are only 20,000 species of butterflies, about a fifth, and for comparison, about 9,000 species of birds, 1,000 species of mice, and only one species of moose. But when you go out moth watching or looking for moths, you can't just take your field guide and flip to the picture and identify every species because there are too many moths. It's too confusing and too many moths look like other moths and there are too many other moths as well. So what people who are serious about moths do is they create a moth collection for themselves or they make use of one of the many fine moth collections in moth-oriented museums around the world. Let me show you some of the moths they have here. Now have a look at this. This is just a tiny fraction of the diversity of moths. Over here, underwing moths in the genus Catacalla in the Noctuid family of owlet moths. These are the center of a cult of people who just love underwing moths. Very interesting. Sphinx moths or hawk moths. These are uh, relatively small sphinx moths. Sphingidae is the family. There are some big, big honking sphinx moths in the tropics. And here, tiger moths. Beautiful moths, a diverse group, very hard to tell apart, but lovely nonetheless. Here, an assortment of microlepidopteran moths in many families. I call them all midididies because I can't tell them apart. We've already seen the pyralid moths, another group of very small moths. Inchworm moths, geometridae moths. You ever wonder what an inchworm grows up to be when it grows up? There's the answer, at least part of the answer. And over there, you might think those were butterflies, but those are day-flying uraneid moths. Butterflies always have a little club on the tip of the antenna. Those antenna come to a fine point. They are moths, not butterflies. This is but the tip of the moth iceberg. The biggest moth is the atlas moth, whose wings are almost the size of a dinner plate. You know, butterflies and moths are Lepidoptera, which means, well, lepido means scale, and ptera means wing, so they're scaly-winged. And then these are the scales that cover the wing of, in this case, a butterfly, but moth scales are much, uh, much the same. They're just like fish scales or shingles. They overlap, they give the wing its texture, and they also give it its color, although you wouldn't know it from this picture, because all scanning electron microscope photographs are black and white. When you see them in color, somebody's been at them with the crayons. You are probably wondering, what do you do if you get a moth in your ear? Well, let me assure you right away that this is a rare medical phenomenon. It will probably never happen to you. However, if it does, what generally happens, what generally occurs is that the afflicted individual, the human individual, is subjected to a noise, something like very loud, which is the sound, of course, of a moth buzzing within the ear canal. Very disturbing. 
It results, generally, once again, in a visit to the office of a qualified physician who then examines the ear with one of these, an ioironososcope is the technical term for them. At the point when the physician is looking into the ear, someone, generally a nurse, makes a joke about light coming out the other ear. Ha, ha, ha! Because everyone in the room is nervous that there may actually be a living creature within this person's head. However, consider the viewpoint of the moth. Looking out what was originally a darkened ear canal, the moth sees a bright light and flies to freedom because, after all, moths are attracted to doctors. Ha, ha! I should know. I am too. In fact, I married one. That's where I got this Ioero nososcope. They don't give them to everyone, you know. This is not a toy. Ah. Isn't this a, just a perfect moth hunting truck? This is my buddy Tracy Kutash. We went to grad school together. I ran into Tracy the other day and I said, hey, what are you doing these days, Tracy? And she told me that she just finished identifying 30,000 moths from Big River, Saskatchewan. So I said, you're the perfect person for our moth show. So here we are. Uh, we've got all the stuff you need in the back for moth blacklighting and moth sugaring. If you don't know what that is, you're in for a big treat. And you know, I think we should, I think we should use this, uh, this truck for our music video too, don't you? I think so. All right, check it out. And everything's all right back here? It seems to be. Okay, I'll take the sheet, the moth book, the headlamp, another moth book, paint brushes, beer, rum, and pail. Battery trap. And that, and the other black light, and <laughs> I guess we'll come back for the pounds of sugar. Well, I'm pretty sure we have enough sugar here. Yeah, that's much sugar. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. So what we're going to do here, we're going to prepare the classic moth sugaring mixture while the sun is still setting from uh, W.J. Holland's equally classic book, uh, The Moth Book. Okay, do, do read us a bit, uh, Tracy. Okay. Tonight, the lightning in the air, the suggestion of a coming storm, which lurks in the atmosphere. It does lurk. It will send a thrill through all the swarms. A, si a thrill? A thrill. <sighs> I couldn't agree more. Where does it say that? Right here. Uh, oh, yes, and they will rise as the dusk gathers in troops about the pathway. It is just the night upon which to take a collecting trip, resorting to the well-known method of sugaring. Sure. I couldn't agree more, W.J. Uh, so... How about the actual recipe itself? Okay. Here we have a bucket and a clean whitewash brush. Brand new. Okay. Ready for action. We have put into the bucket four pounds of cheap sugar. Oh, we have? <laughs> we haven't yet. Here we of, go. Of cheap sugar. This is actually really expensive sugar, but hey. <laughs> there we go. You tell me when four pounds is... A quarter of a pound. Oh, yes. <laughs> four pounds of sugar, exactly. <laughs> Three. Okay. Okay. Done. In the bucket. Now we will pour in a bottle of stale beer. Bottle of stale beer coming right up. Handy that. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's got a look to it, I'll tell you. <laughs> and a little rum. And a little rum. Okay. I've always wondered what rum was good for. <laughs> and here it goes. Little rum. Done? Done. We have stirred the mixture well. We have not yet. But we will. <laughs> Old WJ must have been a real <laughs> impatient guy. Look at this for nice. This is... <laughs> That's I, I, great. <laughs> it's not quite well. Oh, it's sort of bubbling and frothing. It looks ready to me. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Shall we go? Indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before the darkness falls, while yet there is light enough to see our way along the path, we will pass from tree to tree and apply the brush charge with a sweet semi-intoxicating mixture to the trunks of the trees. <sighs> the task is accomplished. Forty trees and ten stumps have been baptized with the sugar-sweetened beer. Let us wash our sticky fingers in the brook and dry them with our handkerchiefs. 
Let us sit down on the grass beneath this tree and puff a good Havana. It is growing darker. The bats are circling overhead. So strangely when they fly around at night Why do you think they like to bash into the lights? Wouldn't it be funny if they went for music too They'd be flying around the radio and the stereo Musical malls playing on the radio Musical malls playing on the radio they come and the moms they go Music keep playing on the radio Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah Okay, well you know the sugaring is a time-honored method, but nowadays if you want to see a lot of moths, the standard technique is to get yourself a black light or a mercury vapor light, take it out into the wilderness and see what comes to visit. We're having a great time here so far. There have been some pale beauties at the light. We also saw one that I'm, I was sure Tracy called it an American idiot. But really she said American idia. It's a whole new world to me. It's very exciting. So uh, hey, check it out. Have a look. So why don't those tiger moths ever stop moving? I don't know. What's their problem? Oh, what's this? Is this one of the prominent moths here? Yeah, actually I think that's a sigmoid prominent. Yeah, you know, they break up the outline of their body when they're resting so birds can't tell what they are. Oh, is that moths? why they do yeah, that? Yeah, and this guy here is playing dead. See, oh, oh yeah. he was playing yeah. dead. Yeah, he's playing dead. Oh, oh, you're right. There he is. Now he's back to life. Very neat. So you'd never guess that was a moth if you were a, uh, you know, moth-eating bird? No. Excellent. So how many how many species have you got that big river at your lights there? We have a, a little over 400 species that we've identified, but there's about 320 that have our numbers. Around. No kidding. Yeah, so 700 and something so far. No kidding, and, and almost half of them are just code numbers. Code numbers. Well, the... Awaiting positive identification. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What uh, What else have we got here? What's What's this triangular thing here? Is that an inchworm moth? No, that's a uh, an owl moth. Really? Yeah. No kidding. What kind? Uh, that's what it, that's Bomaloka. 
it doesn't I can't remember the common name. I don't think it has one. Bomaloka? Bomaloka edictalis. Perfectly pronounceable word. <laughs> <laughs> it's better Bomaloka than a lot of them. Bomaloka edictalis. Duh. What's this guy in the fold here? Oh, this one here? Yeah. That's, That's cloudy arches. It's a nice big one, isn't it? It is a big one. Is, uh, is that another owlet moth? Yeah, another owlet moth. There's a whole bunch of different kind of arches. Oh, there's a pale beauty. Look, look. How pale, how beautiful. Hummingbird moths look so much like hummingbirds that many bird watchers confuse the two from time to time. Are you sure this is going to work? Oh, this technique has stood the test of time. I don't know. Okay. I'm skeptical. Go slow. They're a little spooky sometimes before they've taken their full okay. their full taste of this stuff. Okay, there are moths here. It's working. Yeah. I told you it'd work. Yeah, you did. How about that? I'm surprised. Can... A lot more than I thought. Excellent. So, yeah, look, you can see their little proboscises poked right in there. Excellent. Are these uh, those fellows with no common name up here? Yeah, yeah. That's the Nargia de color. Nargia de color. Hmm. And how about this little triangular thing down here? Ah, that little guy doesn't have a common name either. Is that right? No, yeah. Well, what the heck's going on? Now they're too little. Nobody pays attention to them. Oh, man. There should be more people in this world, like you and I, painting beer and sugar on trees. Then these moths would be famous. Everybody would know their name. Yeah. Good idea. Indeed. And, oh, their little eyes are just glowing away there. Yeah, they look like little rubies. Look neat. They, yeah, they, I'll bet they can see quite well in low light, like, you know, the way cat's eyes seem to glow when glow. you shine a flashlight yeah. at them. Or, wonderful. Hmm. Well, you want to go check one of the other trees? Yeah, let's do see that. See what's happening? Okay. Look, look over there. Oh, over there. Look, look, right on that, right there. Oh. It's an underwing. It's an underwing. It's an underwing. That's excellent. It's working. That's the moth that you want to see when you put out uh, sugar on the trees. Oh, that's perfect. Isn't that incredible? Ooh, that's beautiful. Do you know which uh, which underwing that is? I think it's the once married underwing, but once I'm not sure. Once married underwing. Now, what a nice name. Once married and now it's out drinking. <laughs> Wild. That's so impressive. And look at look how it when it closes the wings it just turns into a piece of bark. Yeah, you can't even see it. Wow. I think those red underwings are to startle bird predators, but I don't know. I th I'm not sure. I it's think just so. such a big beautiful moth. Yeah. <sighs> well, we're excited and it's definitely worthwhile doing this kind of thing, getting out and looking for moths at night. I think it's worthwhile. It's worth it. It's worth it. That's why we're nature nuts and we, we hope, hope you, you are too. too. Take her easy. See you next time. Bye for now. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.